We will now continue this session with virtual rea reality and STEAM. Please welcome Joe Ludwig from Valve. Hi, everybody. I'm afraid that I've ported VR games to Steam, so that makes me a bad person. <laughs> uh, so for the last half hour of our VR mega session, at least the last half hour of the talk part, uh, I'm going to tell you what we're doing with VR and Steam. I'll talk about our VR work in two pieces. The first is uh, to describe our goals and sort of talk about where we're headed. And then I'll go into detail about where we are with that work and what it means for all of you. But I'll start with where we're headed. Our goal is to provide a seamless VR experience while running in Steam. The first step of that is to, is to launch Steam and put on your VR display. And the first stop is the, the login prompt. Uh, VR mode in Steam is the same UI as Big Picture. It's just wrapped on a curved virtual screen that sets several feet in front of the user. The screen is at a fixed point in virtual space. So you're, if you're facing forward, it's centered in front of you. And as you look around, the screen moves to match. Once you log in, you can do anything that you can do in Steam. And in the library, it's easy to filter down to games that support VR and then launch one of those games. Now, many games that support VR don't necessarily support it for the entire experience. And Half-Life 2 is one of these. The bits of code that understand VR um, don't even get loaded until after the, the splash screen goes away. So for those games, Steam will show whatever the game is outputting in, uh, um, on that same virtual screen in what we're calling legacy mode. Um, and in theory, you could run an entire game this way in, in, uh, with streaming. As Half-Life 2 works today, the game starts up in desktop mode and has a button, which I'm told is also bad, um, that uh, switches you to VR mode. But we can do better than that. So instead of doing that, the game asks Steam whether it's already running in VR and then switches to VR mode automatically. From there, it's a game that, that mo that's already out there that most of you have probably already played. If you haven't, check it out, um, because fighting man hacks and playing catch with dog are totally different experiences in VR than they are when you do the same things on the screen. They're definitely worth trying. And while you're in there, you, you would, you're likely to get um, chat messages from your friends, which would cause you to bring up the overlay. The Steam overlay appears on that same sort of curved virtual screen in front of you, and all of the features of the overlay work in VR mode. In other words, our goal is to make VR a first-class platform feature on Steam and to provide users with the best possible experience in the, in the process. So if that's what we're shooting for, what is actually finished? You may have noticed that every image I've shown you up to this point is a mock-up. Um, that's not necessarily an indication of what works and what doesn't. It's just that when you take a, a VR image where, with the distortion turned on and rendered in stereo and then you put it on a slide, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Um, so this is Steam Big Picture running in VR mode. All, the basics are all working, but there is still some work to do. And here's the Steam overlay running in VR mode on top of Half-Life 2. A beta version of both of these shipped in the Steam client beta that started on Monday. They're not entirely where we want them to be. For instance, um, big picture, the VR mode for Steam itself only runs on Windows. Um, but uh, we would appreciate your thoughts. So just run Steam with dash VR on the command line to try them out. Even more important than either of those is that the Steamworks example game, Space War, also runs in VR now. Um, so if you're looking for an example of how to use anything that I'm going to talk about, this is a good place to look. So now that you know what we want to accomplish, let's talk about what exists today and what you can do with it. That same client beta from earlier this week includes a, a new Steamworks call that the game can make to determine if Steam is running in VR mode. So if your game is anything like our games and supports a user switchable mode, then you should make this call and automatically switch to VR. That's an important part of providing a seamless experience. There, there will be a um, Steamworks SDK update coming out uh, in a few weeks that contains, whoops, that contains uh, um, this, this method and, um, and everything else that I'm about to talk about. And in this case, uh, just look on the iSteam utils interface for the is Steam running in VR method. The other thing that makes all of this work is the Steamworks VR API. This is a new addition to the Steam platform that we've written to expand on the services that are provided by the Oculus SDK and by other hardware-specific APIs. The Oculus SDK as it exists today is essentially a device driver. It allows one process to talk to, to one piece of hardware and provides all of the services required to make that work. The Steamworks VR API expands on those capabilities by adding platform-level features uh, that, provide, that uh, apply to all hardware device drivers. 
We decided to build this API because we felt like we could help VR emerge more quickly by addressing a couple of issues. We aren't shipping our own hardware, but by providing software that's uh, used by all of you, um, that's something that we have some experience with. So that's where we've put our energy. The first of those issues is um, making uh, your game continue to work well in VR months or years from now. And that includes both support for new hardware and software updates. The second issue that we're addressing with the Steamworks VR API is that unlike every hardware-specific API we've encountered, it allows multiple apps to talk to a single piece of hardware at the same time. But I'll start with future-proofing. If you don't have a team providing ongoing support for your game, this is very important. Your game will need support for new pieces of hardware and, uh, to, and um, new drivers and that sort of thing to keep your customers happy. And we can, we're happy to provide that. Even if you do have a live team, though, you don't necessarily want to have your live team worrying about new VR stuff. You want to focus on your game. And so uh, this can help you there. The biggest kind of future proofing that uh, this Steamworks helps with is new VR hardware. These are some of the HMDs and tracking systems that we've been able to run our games on over the last year and a half. At the moment, none of these is consumer ready, although the Oculus Rift is the closest by far. That's all going to change over the next year or two, though, and we've already seen some other uh, VR hardware start to emerge. If you use the, the Steamworks VR API, you'll get support for any of these devices that become commonplace automatically without making any changes to your game. Of course, it's also likely that eventually new hardware will include new features that aren't in the API yet. And when that happens, we'll rev the API so that new games will get uh, access to those features, while older games will continue to work without modification, just like they do with existing Steamworks features. Even without new hardware, though, there are still reasons to write to the Steamworks API instead of directly to a hardware vendor's API, and that's software updates. All sorts of features can be unlocked in a piece of hardware without um, uh, uh, just by upgrading its driver. Unfortunately, moving to a new driver for the Rift currently means relinking your game against a new version of a static library. But even if the API were in a DLL, the interfaces aren't versioned or backward compatible, so it wouldn't be possible to swap that DLL out with a new one um, without rebuilding the game. Uh, when you use the Steamworks VR API, we can update the implementation under your game uh, without requiring you to ship your game again. But there's another more immediate reason to prefer the Steamworks API, and it's often the case that multiple apps need access to the hardware at the same time. This is a common problem with hardware devices. For a bunch of devices, like keyboards and mice and monitors, the operating system just abstracts away the whole, uh, the whole thing and provides an abstract API to the, to the software. And for video cards, it's the job of OpenGL or DirectX to manage access to those devices. The Steamworks VR API fills the same niche for VR hardware that OpenGL does for video cards. Any part of, um, and part of what it does is allow any number of VR apps to get display geometry and head tracking data from a single head-mounted display. There's nothing magical here. It's just a little IPC communication. But asking every game or every hardware vendor uh, to provide this service is not realistic. And thanks to the Steamworks VR API, when you run Steam in VR mode, which you can do as of Monday, um, the game that you launch in VR mode can actually connect to the hardware instead of just failing to init the vendor-specific APIs. So how does this actually work? I'm going to go this, through this quickly. And I'm assuming that um, you've uh, interacted with Rift SDK or some other uh, piece of VR hardware. But if not, your best bet is probably to look at the Steamworks example to, to see how to, uh, how to build a VR app in the first place. So let's start with the first call that you're likely to make, which tells you where to put your window. By the way, all of this is in the Steamworks documentation, so don't worry about writing any of it down. I'm just going to buzz through the functions and the API quickly so that you can ask questions while we're still here at Dev Days. If you run into any problems hooking, hooking any of this up, uh, please contact your Steam technical contact or shoot me an email. And my email address is on the last slide. Git window bounds returns exactly that. X and Y are desktop coordinates with and height, the, the, width and height of the display. These are the same values that you would see in the screen resolution control panel on Windows or in display options on, on Linux. Git display bounds is just a way to get them programmatically in a cross-platform way. Next up is Git eye output viewport. This is the area in the window that you'll need to draw into for each eye. This is the first of a few calls that include an API type parameter. This is either DirectX or OpenGL, and all it does is transform the numbers that you get back into the, the right coordinate system for that API. 
for some displays, you could just divide the, the uh, display in half horizontally and assume that the left half is the left eye and the right half is the right eye. Um, and that may work today, but there's no guarantee that the two eyes will be arranged that way in the frame buffer for every future hardware device. So you're better off just making a quick call to get the bounds for each eye. And this is what they would look like on the Rift. You'll also need to fetch the projection matrix that's used for each eye. Uh, this will be an off-center projection that's appropriate for whatever HMD is connected. This matrix will represent a slightly wider field of view than is visible in the final output. Um, but rendering these extra pixels into your pre-distorted image maximizes the field of view that you show for the user. And the, the stretch projection is backed out again by the distortion operation later. Next up is get eye matrix. The eye matrix adjusts the in-world cameras for the user's interpupillary distance, or IPD. This is what gives you the stereo effect when you put on a VR display. The API knows what the user's IPD is, so all you have to do is fetch the matrix and then multiply it in between your view and projection matrices. The final display geometry function I'm going to mention is get recommended render target size. This function tells you how big your pre-distorted uh, render target needs to be, and uh, using the size will tune your texture to match the projection matrix in the distortion function. And this is important to minimize the stretching of pixels that cause blurring in the middle of the display. There are a couple of other display functions, but these are all the ones that you need to get up and running. So look at the Steamworks documentation uh, for details on the others. Next up is distortion, uh, which we're doing a little bit differently than, than uh, has been done in the past, and uh, helps to compensate for the distortion that's introduced by the lenses in the display. The way this usually works is that you render the undistorted scene into an off-screen render target, and then you run it through some sort of function in the pixel shader to get it back out to the final screen pixels. The problem with this is the function or specifically that there are a whole bunch of them. Every combination of lenses and panels and distances and geometry for the display uh, cause a different distortion function. Many of these are radial, so they're, they're related to the distance that the pixel is from the center of the lens, but even that's not universal. And while games usually want control of every shader so that they can understand the performance characteristics of that shader, expecting every game to implement every possible distortion function is just not realistic. So what we're doing instead is that it computes, we compute the distortion values once at startup and then uh, use a lookup texture in the actual shader. This keeps the shader itself very simple and uh, uh, doesn't require any game side changes to add a new function. The compute distortion function just returns the distortion values to the game. So you just call it a loop to populate your texture. What we found is a 128 by 128 texture is plenty, although you will want at least 16 bits per channel in that texture. And you can find a working example of this in the Steamworks example or in the source SDK. The last area covered by the Steamworks VR, VR API is head tracking. And there are a couple of functions involved in this. The first one is get world from head pose. This function takes a number of seconds into the future to predict motion, which is an important part of why, our, why the tracking in our um, demo looks so solid, that we predict where your head is going to be and account for some of the latency that way. Note that this pose is a 3 by 4 translation rotation matrix. Including translation support in your game is a key part of future proofing. While the, the DK1 doesn't have uh, translation support, um, they started showing off Crystal Cove last week at CES, and it does. And we expect every significant um, VR display going forward to have translation support. This returns the head pose which is a point centered between the user's eyes in a right-handed coordinate system with negative Z facing forward, positive Y facing up, and positive X to the right. Now, I mentioned that the, this pose um, includes position, but I didn't really get into why that's important. I mean, it's important for the totally mundane reason that it is uh, much less, it reduces one cause that could make you sick. Um, but other than that, I mean. There's an entire class of game that's enabled by translation that doesn't work on a display that has rotation-only tracking. Any game where the object of gameplay is something that's sitting in front of you and that the player will orbit around is something that needs location to know where the player's, it needs to know where the player's head is to know what to draw. A rotation-only system can't tell the difference between a, gesture, a, a head track like this and turning your head like this. <clears throat> so you have to have position to be able to draw the right thing. An example of that would be something like a virtual Jenga game, where the, the stack of blocks is sitting in front of you, and you move your head over here to see the left side of the blocks. Uh, we think that uh, there are a bunch of possibilities for this kind of game. And, and once this tracking becomes commonplace, we'll start to see a lot of examples. 
The other tracking function your game will likely use is zero tracker. This sets the user's current position and yaw rotation uh, as the origin of every future pose returned by the API. This is important for games that are applying head tracking information on top of some sort of in-world uh, player position. If you never call zero tracker, then all poses will be in, in whatever tracking space is, which is usually based on, on a camera or base station in the case of a positional tracking system, or possibly the, the center uh, between the user's eyes in a rotation-only tracking system. The one thing that won't change with zeroing the tracker is that positive Y is always up. Zeroing the tracker affects yaw and position, but it doesn't affect pitch and roll. Uh, it, and it uses the internal sensors in the tracking system to determine which way is up. So I realized that was a lot to take in. Uh, if you want to learn more, check out the Steamworks example. Um, check out the Steamworks documentation. Or you can find me after this, ask questions during the, the Q&A session that we have up next, or um, send us an email. The last thing I want to talk about is what we're doing with VR in the store. In addition to the fact that you can now use the store in VR, uh, we're also adding a VR support indicator that's similar to the controller support indicator. And that includes uh, putting the game into a category for games that support VR. Checking the same box that you check in the Steamworks site to give you access to the Steamworks VR API sets this category for your game uh, to make it easier for people to find the game. So when's all this going to be out in the world? Well, much of what I talked about is finished and is in the current Steam client beta. And that includes VR mode in Steam, at least on Windows, and uh, VR mode in the overlay. Sometime in the next few weeks, we'll be releasing a new version of uh, the Steamworks SDK that can, includes the rest of it. In the meantime, here's a link to the VR documentation on the Steamworks site, another link to the, um, to the slides from my GDC talk from last year about our experience getting VR mode working in TF2, and then the third link here is to the Steam community hub for uh, VR mode. That's where people are talking about VR mode in Steam. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions on all of this, about five minutes, it looks like. Um, and then we'll take a break for, for 10 minutes and bring folks back up here for the Q&A. Hi, Joe. Hi. Um, so if we've uh, started with Unity and used, their, uh, used the Oculus Unity plugin, um, what's, what's the roadmap to getting to the uh, Steamworks VR uh, from there? So um, we have it up and running in Unity. We don't have anything we're ready to ship yet. Um, but for, uh, for Unity at least, and hopefully for other engines, it will be a pretty straightforward uh, process. Most of the work of getting your game into VR should be um, easily transported between the two, because getting things rendering in stereo, getting your effects working, getting the UI working, that's the hard stuff. And none of that is any different between the two. Would the VR API work if the user is not using Steam, or will it only work with Steam? At, at the moment, it, it only works if the game is uh, being launched from Steam. Um, that's if, if the, you have a, a set of games that can't be Steamworks for whatever reason, then we, we could certainly talk about it. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Do you have any plans for supporting uh, separate position tracking versus rotation tracking? So it gives you the matrix, uh, so you can uh, do whatever you need to with the translation and the rotation. Um, if, you, if you have rotation only in the tracking system, it will actually provide you a position based on a head and neck model. Um, but you could ignore the position and just use rotation if, if that's appropriate for whatever your game is. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody.